Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. Justin Feldman from Feldman Physical Therapy and Performance. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about heart rate variability. We're gonna go through what it is, how you should be measuring it, if you should be measuring it, and what judgments, interpretations you can make from those measurements to improve both your overall health and just your training in general. So start off a little bit here, what is heart rate variability? So heart rate variability is different from your heart rate in that we're talking about the variability of times between the beats. So if your heart rate is say 60 beats per minute, it's not exactly beating once per second, right? It might be beating a little bit off from that and we kind of hope that it is. And so we're measuring the variability between those beats. And so it's gonna be measured in milliseconds. Now, unlike your heart rate, or let's say your resting heart rate, where we're looking, and we could generally make a judgment about somebody's health based on their resting heart rate, we're looking for that resting heart rate to be lower. Lower is generally a, a better number. With your heart rate variability, we're actually looking for more variability. So higher numbers are generally the other thing with heart rate variability is that you can't compare your number to my number. So our two numbers will be different. Resting heart rate, we can usually say, hey, if my resting heart rate's in the 40s and somebody else's is maybe in the 60s, we can make a general interpretation of the, the two of us compared. With heart rate variability, that's not so. So really, when you're looking at this, just compare your numbers to your numbers. We're measuring the balance in your nervous system between your parasympathetic nervous system, so your resting and digesting, and your sympathetic nervous system, which is more your fight or flight. And the more you're getting into sort of that resting state, right, the higher we're gonna see those numbers, and the more you're gonna be able to adapt to different stresses of life and recover. The more stress you're under, and this can be physical stress, emotional stress, mental stress, any sort of stress, the higher, or the lower, sorry, the lower your heart rate variability is gonna go, which means you're in more of that sympathetic state. And so that's more of that fight or, or flight state. When we're looking at this, the benefit of this is that we're able to measure total body stress. So we're not just measuring, say, stress on your cardiac system uh, based on your heart rate or other stuff like that. Um, the amount of sort of chronic or like level of inflammation in your body has been shown to really affect this number. And so for different cases of sort of chronic disease and different things, we will see this affect your heart rate variability, which makes it a really interesting way to measure health. Now, we're gonna talk about how to track it. Before we get into how to track your heart rate variability, if you're finding this video useful, helpful, any of those things, please jump down. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, get more and more content like this out to you guys. So we really appreciate all the support there. So how do we track our heart rate variability? Well, thankfully, uh, it's getting easier and easier to do recently. So you might recall, and I'll throw a, a link up here to this video. Uh, we talked uh, almost two years ago now, made a little video about the best devices to uh, used to improve your health. And they weren't supposed to be for training, right? this was just to improve your overall health. And the ability to measure this was one of the metrics that we used. And it was interesting at the time, there was a lot of discrepancy between different devices. We weren't getting great, accurate measurements. Now, over the last couple of years, this has improved tremendously. And so I've been tracking my heart rate variability for a while. And you, I've been using uh, the both the Whoop Band, Aura Ring, uh, play around a little bit with Apple Watch and some of the um, Garmin devices, as well as uh, one of the newer Coros watches also will measure this. And so what we get when we're uh, doing this is the ability to track it over time. And so prior to these devices measuring it, essentially while we were sleeping, we used to have to put on a heart rate strap right when you woke up and generally stay still for about 60 seconds while you recorded the reading. And this wasn't exactly the easiest thing to do in order to get an accurate reading because yes, as long as you did it in the same situations every day, you were gonna get 
a, an okay reading, but this is going to change basically you know, if your alarm wakes you up or you get up, maybe go to the bathroom, let the dog out, and then put the strap on and do it. All this stuff will change the results. So being able to get it accurately in our most restful state during overnight sleep is really the best thing that we can do for this. Um, so I've been really pleased with how much both the Woot, the Aura, the Garmin devices are lining up and giving me pretty much the same reading uh, every morning when I wake up and look at it. And so this is really the best way to track it. It's overnight. Now, the thing with heart rate variability is because you're only comparing your data to you, we need a baseline. And so generally we tell people to be measuring this for at least 20 days in order to get your baseline before you start even making any judgments or interpretations about how you might be doing or how you're faring with different things. And then we're gonna compare your seven day average, so sort of your, the average of your heart rate variability over seven days with that sort of moving 30 day average. And then this will generally help us make both long-term interpretations and short-term interpretations. The big thing here is that you can get a little bit of information from one number when you wake up one morning and check it, but we're not gonna make any major decisions off of one data point when it comes to this heart rate variability. We'll get into a little bit certain situations where that might change and that might be a little bit different. Um, and the first one is gonna be that your heart rate variability, a, a sudden change in this can be indicative of uh, sickness or illness or different, you know, something setting on, whether it's a bacterial infection, a viral infection, uh, any sort of thing like that. And so what we'll see is people who have been measuring their heart rate variability for a while and have a pretty good idea where that average is, if they see a pretty quick drop one day, a lot of times that will even be before they have symptoms of anything going on. And then maybe later that day or even the next day or over during that evening, they might start to feel symptoms of being sick or, or not feeling good, might get a fever, any of these sort of things. And this was kind of popularized a lot with some of the COVID stuff and different things, being able to show that there's possibility of testing or finding for these uh, illnesses before you're really even symptomatic and before you even know you have it. And so that can be useful, um, especially if you see that sudden dip and you have maybe a big training day plan, might be a good idea to take an easier day because that might improve your immune system's ability to fight off whatever might be coming up. Now, if we're using this heart rate variability to track training over time, what we're really looking to do is we want to know when your body's ready to take on more load and when your body might need you to step it back a little bit. And this is where heart rate variability is really useful because it's a measure of that overall stress on your system that includes the other stressors outside of your training, whether it's work, family, other things that might be going on. And what we can see is that if we start to push through those other stresses, right? Because your body really, you know, stress is stress is stress to your body. And so if we start pushing through those other stressors, we start to notice little injuries here and there that might not have occurred had we not done that. It's just your body's ability to adapt and cope with the load of training decreases. Now, the other thing we see is if you are constantly pushing through a lowering HRV as you're training, we you start to get into what we call overtraining syndrome, or we like to refer to it as under recovery syndrome. We can sort of use those things synonymously. And what we're seeing is your body is just not adapting to training over time. And that's becoming sort of chronic. So it's not one or two workouts in a week or something like that, that was a lot higher than you could adapt for. It's becoming sort of your standard that you're not adapting to it. And then you start to see more severe injuries. And these are the things that take a long time to come back from. As your body stops adapting to your training, you start to have all sorts of other physiological things going on that will really affect your ability to maintain your overall health. And we wanna be really careful in these situations. And one of the reasons we call it under recovery syndrome is because a lot of times what we're finding 
it's not so much that maybe your training load is significantly higher than we want it to be, but it might be that you're not spending enough time sleeping, recovering, we're not getting the diet and the other things into our body that can really help us recover. And so we're just not adapting to the training. And so the other way it's referred to is sort of like maladaptive training syndrome. And so it's not that what you're doing is necessarily too much, but your body is not adapting to it and you need to make a change. And this is where noticing these things in our HRV can help us make that change before we start to have that injury or illness or anything like that. And so this is why I think that for athletes and general population alike, tracking this can be really helpful because whether you're training for a really big triathlon or marathon or just training to get through life and get through every day, if we start to see that all of a sudden your body's not adapting to the stress you're putting on it, and that could just be work, right? We can make a change. We can go for a recovery walk. We can start to spend more time working on different recovery strategies, mindfulness strategies, relaxation type things, take more time for that before we end up with a bigger health problem. And we see that as we push through these things, we have rising levels of chronic inflammation, which is also associated with different diseases and other negative things that we don't want. And we can recognize the early signs of that with this HRV data and combat it before we have a problem. And anytime we can do that, it's you know invaluable information. So I do think this is something that, I'll, that I would love to see more people get into tracking, especially as it becomes easier with uh, more devices that are really unintrusive. I mean, I, I find the Aura Ring to be one of the most accurate and easy to use things ever. And, you know, if you're going to wear a ring anyway, it's, it's just a, a simple, easy thing to do. Um, and so same sort of idea, right? Boot band just sits on here. You can measure it. If you're going to wear a watch, you've got so many options of watches that are great at tracking this. Um, and maybe we'll create another video later uh, with the, the differences between each device and how they, how they track it. What I want to do last here is I want to end with a little bit of a case study to sort of show how we can use this information. And so good news is that I've been tracking this information on me for a really long time. And so I get to be the case study. So I uh, just recently trained and completed the Ironman up in Lake Placid. And I've been tracking my HRV for four or five years-ish now. And so I've got a lot of data. And my rolling average is roughly in the, the low 60s, high 50s. For my, for my normal. And as I got into more and more training and the training volume really crept up, I started to notice that it was creeping up into the 70s, which was great for me because I knew that I was adapting to the training. And I would actually notice after a really long training day, my HRV would be really built up for a couple of days, which was great. Exactly what I'm looking for, showing me how I'm adapting to the training. Then comes race day. And one of the things I started to notice leading up to the race was four or five days before the race, one, we were in a strange place. I was staying in a hotel and I don't sleep great in strange places. And I started to notice my HRV coming down. I just wasn't getting the recovery I wanted. Also, there's probably a fair amount of stress, whether I want to admit it or not, about how the race was going to go and the logistics and all that stuff. And so I wasn't too worried about that. Um, and in fact, I pay attention to this stuff pretty regularly, but leading up to an event day or two before, and especially the day of, I intentionally don't look at it because I don't want it to affect my mindset going into the competition because I know I'm going to do it and I'm going to push myself sort of no matter what that data says. Now, did the race. Following the race now, my uh, HRV has barely broken 48 after the race. So prior to the race, I was in the mid to high 70s. My long-term average is in the high 50s, low 60s. And now I'm really struggling three weeks out now to break 48 or 50. And so to me, this is a great way to know that even though my body is feeling like it's coming back and things are starting to feel good, it is far from recovery. And what I will see is as I do a workout, light run, easy bike ride, anything like that, Instead of seeing my HRV climb over the next couple of days, like I was when I was really 
training and, and everything leading up to the race, I will see my HRV dip for a couple days. And so I've sort of been doing one day on, two days off. And this allows me to slowly start creeping back into things, but really paying attention to what's going on. I've also tried to layer in some extra sleep and I'm just really taking it slow. And for me, knowing I don't have anything big coming up, I'm really watching this data, listening to the information, and that's how I'm going to make my judgment about when I return to more vigorous structured training as I, I know that my body will be ready for it. And I want to be super careful not to rush back into things too soon because I don't want to end up with an injury that affects me for months or, or uh, long term going on after that. So that is HRV in a nutshell how you can use it and why I think you should track it. Uh, any questions, please go ahead and post them down in the comments below. If you have a favorite device, something you like to use, let us know down in the comments below and we'll see you back here real soon.